For a third consecutive generation, one Romanov had snatched the crown from another. But his father's murder left the new Tsar, 23-year-old Alexander Pavlovich, racked with guilt. I'm sure they told Alexander that Paul would simply be pushed aside, and I'm sure Alexander persuaded himself that that would be the case. But it wasn't realistic. You couldn't have a retired Tsar sitting in some palace on the outskirts of Petersburg waiting for the next coup against his son in order to be restored. It was never viable. Though Alexander had no part in the coup, he did nothing to stop it. Similar indecision and contradictions would cloud Alexander's reign. Inspired by liberal ideals, the new Tsar flirted with granting Russia a constitution, but he would never follow through. Under Alexander I, it was difficult to know in what direction Russia would go. He couldn't make that decision, that momentous, heroic decision uh, to oversee the devolution of his own power. As Alexander wavered about the future of Russia, a continent away, a bold upstart declared himself Emperor of France and plunged ahead with plans to remake all of Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte. You could not find two more different men than Napoleon and Alexander I. Napoleon was completely filled with self-confidence. He felt called upon to be the master of the universe, never doubting his genius, and never doubting his flair, never doubting his strategy. Whereas Alexander I um, seems to have been born confused uh, and not knowing exactly what direction he wants to take. And so he goes off in all these various directions. In 1807, Napoleon would force Alexander to sign a treaty of friendship, but the Tsar of Russia and the self-made Emperor of France were fated to wind up bitter enemies in a struggle for the fate of Europe. As the French destroy the two great intermediary powers, Prussia and Austria, Russia is faced with a big dilemma, because obviously if Napoleon dominates the whole of Europe from the Atlantic to the Russian border, he controls such immense resources that he's basically going to be able to get, make Russia do whatever he wants. In 1811, Alexander finally took a stand. Defying Napoleon's grand ambitions, he declared allegiance with England and prepared for all-out war with France. Napoleon answered in force. Close to half a million fighting men, the largest army in European history, marched on Moscow. In the face of overwhelming forces, the Tsar's commanders turned to the strategy that had served Russia for centuries, fall back and harass the invaders as they struggled across the vast motherland. All summer long, Napoleon marched deeper and deeper into Russia. He looked for a decisive battle, but found only an empty and unwelcoming land. On the morning of September 7, 1812, one day's ride from Moscow, Napoleon finally found what he was looking for. 120,000 Russian soldiers, Alexander's imperial army, ready to fight to the death for the fields of Borodino. Borodino, September 7, 1812. The armies of two great empires attacked and counterattacked. The bloodbath began at dawn and went on long past dark. For over a decade, Napoleon Bonaparte had seemed invincible as he marched across Europe. Tsar Alexander's Russian armies were the last obstacle to continental dominance. For Napoleon to win in 1812, he had to destroy the Russian army, because otherwise they would just go on retreating in front of him, and in the end, uh, his own line of supply would become so immense that his army would disintegrate. 75,000 men would die that day. Both sides would claim victory. Still, the death toll convinced the Russian generals to leave the field and the city of Moscow to Napoleon. The losses on both sides were enormous, and it was very clear to the French soldiers and generals um, that the Russian army's will to fight was by no means exhausted. For weeks, Napoleon waited for Alexander to concede defeat. 
Then the Russians set fire to his prize, Moscow. More than half the city burned to the ground. To the Russian people, it was a sacrilege. For Napoleon, it was a disaster. The main impression was horror, that having marched all this way and seized Moscow, he was actually no closer to achieving his goal because sitting in Moscow through the winter, even if the city hadn't been destroyed, was impossible. Napoleon's order to retreat came too late. The Russian winter came early and hard. The French were 1,500 miles from home, with little to eat and no shelter from the storm. Then, the Emperor Alexander called on the Russian people to annihilate the enemy. Russians of every class rose in fury and fell on the invaders. Napoleon's mark of invincibility had been taken away from him. I mean, after all, he lost well over 500,000 men in that campaign. The losses were immense, huge, and in some ways the losses of the horses were even more important than the losses of the men, because even after losing half a million men, in Russia, which was simply unprecedented in European history. What he couldn't do was make up for the loss of trained cavalry and trained artillery. And in that sense, the retreat was vastly important because the French cavalry was virtually wiped out. Napoleon had entered Russia with the largest army in European history. By the time they reached the Polish border, his Grande Armée had been reduced to barely 25,000. For Alexander, the burning of Moscow had sparked a mystical religious conversion. The born-again Orthodox Tsar now embarked on a holy crusade to eliminate Bonaparte and return the capitals of Europe to their rightful monarchs. Alexander feels that God has rewarded him for his strength and for his renewed Christian faith by giving him Napoleon, you know, on a plate, if you like, defeating the conqueror of Europe. Armies from Prussia and Austria joined the crusade. In 1814, with the Tsar himself in command, the Allied forces swept across Europe to the gates of Paris. For 25 years, France had endured revolution and endless war. Paris was ready for an end to chaos. Alexander entered Paris in triumph. This is actually the culmination of the 18th century in Russia. For the entire 18th century, Russia had been drawing itself closer and closer to Europe, trying to prove that it was an equal partner in the family of Europe. And now, here was the Russian Tsar leading the Allied troops from all of Europe to unseat the evil usurper. But in the cradle of the revolution, Russia's elite guardsmen saw the power of liberal politics in action. The ideas that these Russian soldiers picked up were ideas of a constitutional monarchy, not an absolutist monarchy. The idea that civil and political rights was something that all people should enjoy. The idea that equality before the law should be, and indeed a regime based on rule by law, should be the foundation for any modern state. On their return to Russia, many young officers who had ridden with Alexander into Paris remained inflamed with ideas of liberty and reform. They met in secret and plotted the unthinkable, a constitution for absolutist, czarist Russia. The would-be revolutionaries had no confidence the czar would lead the way. Alexander had abandoned liberal ideas too often before. Tsar Alexander, though well aware of the rising fever for reform, instead withdrew into religious mysticism. In 1825, by the shores of the Black Sea, the emperor died. Childless himself, the Tsar had left the throne to his younger brother, Nicholas. Nicholas